you know, and finally the weather started to make us feel like it's the holiday season, a little, you know, December kind of weather. So in a way it's sort of good, in another way it's sort of wet, but it's okay. Uh, welcome to everyone. My name is Gail Carr Williams from Vanderbilt University, and I'm just happy to be here today. Today is the third of a three-part Food for Thought program. Um, partnership that we have with the Frist Center for Visual Arts and it is an amazing partnership for us and I hope as well for the Frist and I think this year unlike the two years three years before we show three different exhibits and it's been really um, great for us and uh, I, I think that uh, hopefully for you all you have found that it has been interesting and worth your time and while to be here but before I throw this over to our panel uh, with our moderator, Megan Robert Robertson. I just want to give a shout out to somebody here today. She has been to all three of these, and I think she may have come last year. And she's beautiful, and she's 100 years old. She is so beautiful. Her name is Annie Pearl Austin. And every time she's here, you know, it makes me feel so proud that I do this program and I have this great opportunity to do it. Look at Annie back there, and she's all dressed for the holidays, all red. Hey. And to know that I get the grand opportunity in Vanderbilt and Frisk, get the grand opportunity to engage so many different people in something as fabulous as the arts that happened here at the Frisk Center for Visual Arts, and it all happens in Nashville. Oh, are we lucky or what? That's our holiday gift to ourselves. So thank you all so much for being here. Before you leave, make certain, if you haven't already, you take the time to visit the exhibits, visit the gift shop. It is indeed the holiday season, and they have some awfully cool things in there. And what I did notice in there today is Thistle Farms is in there. And Thistle Farms, of course, is um, a local nonprofit that helps women who have had hard times and Becca Stevens, who was head of it, was one of the CNN top 10 heroes in our country. So way to go again for really supporting Nashville. So anyhow, I know you didn't come to hear all about that, but I'm going to turn it over to Megan. And again, it's just been our honor to be here with you all for these three sessions this fall. Thank you so much for the partnership. We appreciate it immensely. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gail, and I'd like to reciprocate that from the Frist Center for the Visual Arts. We are so grateful to Vanderbilt University and the Office of Community, Neighborhood, and Government Relations um, for partnering with us on this series. It's become such a staple of our programming, and we're eternally grateful to Gail um, and all of the amazing women that she works with at that office uh, to put this series together. Today, we're so pleased to welcome you all for our final panel. We will be discussing the exhibition, Ragnar, Kjartensen, The Visitors, and I'm joined on today's panel um, by two gentlemen. One is our chief curator, Mark Scala, here at the Frist Center, and next to me we have Lutz Kopnik, who is the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor of German and Professor of Cinema and Media Arts, uh, again at Vanderbilt University. We always want to make sure we have, have someone from, from the school on the panel to represent um, just their really amazing offerings and the diversity of its staff. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Mark um, so that he can introduce the exhibition and just kind of set us up for today's conversation. Thanks, Megan. Um, thank you, Gail. It's always just a, pl a pleasure and a privilege to have uh, a chance to participate in the Food for Thought. Uh, unfortunately, Lutz is a professor of German and not Icelandic, but I think we'll probably... <laughs> We were saying as we, as we looked at the weather outside that December in, December in Nashville is kind of like July in Iceland. So I think that <laughs> <laughs> so this should be a very appropriate and apropos talk. Um, I, I gave a public lecture a few weeks ago and I talked about the first exposure that I had with Ragnar's work and that was in New York at the Loring Augustine Gallery. Uh, this was the visitors and I, I, I came to it because uh, Susan Edwards, our director, had seen it and she said, well, Mark, you really should go take a look. Um, and I completely fell in love with it and I was completely um, unfamiliar with this artist. 
And one of the things that, for those of you who may be unfamiliar with him, we will give you a little bit of, of context and background today to help you sort of understand where the visitors really comes from and what, what tradition Ragnar has established for himself. He's actually a very, very well-known artist in the art world. He's having a, a real moment. Um, he has been uh, Iceland's representative to the Venice Biennale twice in 20, 2009 and 13. He's had shows at the Musée de Beaux Arts in Montreal, he, at, or excuse me, at the Contemporary uh, in Montreal, the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, the New Museum, the Carnegie Museum of Art, and he currently has a retrospective on view at the Hirshhorn Museum of Art that was organized by the Barbican Center in London. So a busy, busy human being, and that was one of the reasons why, as, as hard as Megan tried to get him to come and give a talk, uh, he was just like, he's a global dude, you know, he's all over the, he's all over the, the uh, place and extraordinarily busy. Um, the visitors, when it was shown at Loring Augustine Gallery, uh, boasted the largest attendance that they had ever had. Um, it has the, the, the installation has been shown at the ICA in Boston, at the Guggenheim Bilbao, at the Broad Museum of Art. It was one of the uh, uh, works that opened the new Broad Museum in LA. Uh, it's been shown in a lot of places, but we were very fortunate to have it here. When we requested that it come to the Frisch Center, the gallery said, well, you know, you join the list. You know, they showed me a list of three pages long of museums and galleries that were really interested in having uh, the visitors come to, to, uh, to them. Um, there are only six prints or six videos in the edition, and so it's very, very hard to, um, to, to spread that out as much as people wanted to. But when Ragnar saw that it was in Nashville, he was very, very excited about having the project shown here in Nashville, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we, when we discuss some of his uh, interest in music. Um, Ragnar's work is oftentimes deceptively simple. He'll start with a very simple proposition. Music sung or some sort of theatrical event uh, played or enacted repetitively by performers often in unexpected places or situations. And the real aim is to encourage contemplation, mindfulness, kind of taking in the world in a way that cuts through the noise, cuts through, through, through the, the uh, busyness and the sense of urgency that we all have in everyday life. The Visitors is a nine-part film. How many of you, can you can I have a show of hands? How many of you have seen it? Okay, well, that's excellent. So a, a very large por part, a portion of you. Uh, it's a nine-screen um, nine, uh, installation filmed in the 43-room Rokeby Farm, which is the Astor family estate in Dutchess County, New York. And it's, uh, you will, those of you who saw it, know that there are eight musicians spread throughout the home, and there is a ninth screen showing people on, on the porch in the front. And the musicians are playing a very absorbing, uh, compelling composition um, that, that takes a, about an hour to unfold. And it starts off very slowly and melodically, and it kind of swells mournfully to... And, and, um, to, to uh, it's kind of a heart feeling uh, crescendo. Uh, so very, very beautiful. Um, but what you will have struck, uh, been struck with as you enter is the isolation of the musicians. They're all sort of separate from each other. They don't have the standard cues that musicians have as they play in an ensemble kind of environment. All they have is, is the ability to listen to one another on headphones. So it's very introspective and I think in many ways a reflection on the, on the, the nature of artistic creativity and the nature of isolation and the, and the notion that oftentimes emotion is, uh, is something that is connected to us through technology. So I think it's a very profound statement in and of itself, but it's, it's much more than that. And, and we'll show you a little clip of it, but uh, of course, please do go up and see the exhibition afterward. So um, let's, let's move on. This is a bit of, this is a bit. So that's what they call the Brady Bunch version. The experience of it is actually nothing like that. But uh, it gives you a little, a little taste of what to expect when you go into the gallery. 
Thank you, Mark, for um, sharing a little bit about the piece itself. But I think um, for a lot of our audience, um, that learning a little bit more about the artist and kind of where he comes from and his motivations will be illuminating. So if we could um, explore how his home country, Iceland, has shaped his aesthetic and artistic identity. And I'll, I'll actually kick this to Lutz <laughs> first, because he's noted how um, the inhospitable climate has shaped its culture in important ways. Well, thanks. Thanks, first of all, for um, to the Food for Thought program as well for the first to uh, have me here today. I mean, I also want to uh, express my gratitude to um, to Mark and the, the whole staff here of bringing actually Wagner's uh, installation here. Um, as Mark already said, I mean, I can only echo this as one of the most moving pieces I've seen in a long time. I've I've seen and heard some of Wagner's work uh, before. Sometimes not even knowing I was listening to it or seeing it like the uh, SS hangover in uh, Venice, uh, only years later I realized that it was one of his pieces, but uh, the show that's up here right uh, today, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a um, very moving piece, but it's also a very challenging piece, and it, uh, as you already mentioned, it, it raises all kinds of very profound questions about the human condition, about our emotions, about um, music, about collaboration, about what it means to be in many respects in the world today, uh, how to handle media. It also raises really interesting questions for me who's working on, on all kinds of cinemas today about what cinema is and how we engage with uh, screens and media in our lives. So although it seems like a very simple fee uh, piece, uh, it really triggers all kinds of questions and I think we'll, we'll be able today uh, hopefully to address uh, some of those or at least open up it. So you ask about his background, Iceland. Um, I mean, whoever has been in Iceland or whoever has heard about Iceland, known to be a country that is very inhospitable, uh, a country of very, at times, brutal, violent kinds of natures that uh, doesn't really seem to open much of a space for humans. And is, as you uh, perhaps know, sort of Iceland only has about 330,000 people, of which uh, 200,000 or so live in the capital of Reykjavik a capital which is, whatever, a, 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 a tiny bit of, uh, of Nashville, uh, if you want as such. So, although it has sort of, it's very much structured by beautiful but also challenging and um, sublime nature, uh, you often would think that there's not much space for, for, for humans to interact uh, meaningfully and to produce uh, great culture, if you wish. But Iceland is actually that kind of place that that does that, and it's quite amazing. Um, it's, a, it's a very tightly knit uh, community of people, uh, all very much focused in the capital of, of Reykjavik. And um, I think what has led to this, uh, this kind of tightly knit uh, community where kind of everyone knows each other is really sort of living in face of uh, an amazing landscape, a kind of inhospitable uh, uh, natural surrounds where people just move together in order to interact with each other in ways that we know uh, very rarely in other uh, areas of the world. Uh, and uh, some amazing facts about Iceland that I think are helpful to sort of understand the background of what Ragnar is doing is, uh, for instance, the largest existing democracy in the Western world, uh, sort of known for its um, sort of interactive, collaborative uh, spirit. It's the number one country on the World Peace Index. Uh, you'd virtually see no police person there on the ground because it's virtually not necessary. Uh, it's also the country with the highest, and this is important here, the highest literacy rate in the world. Um, where from early on everyone is encouraged not to not just to read in Icelandic but in other languages as well. So the level of culturedness uh, of education is enormous in this country while the tightly knit fabric of the society has really led, uh, produced also conditions where sort of divisions or distinctions also between high and low or popular and elite culture uh, are not as profoundly um, um, uh, developed as in, as in other countries. And that has led to a cultural climate uh, of, of enormous intensity, uh, where we actually see something we might not expect from a country like this, a lot of very experimental art, um, music and art that is experimental, that challenges the borders that is outside of the box, uh, that sort of on some level speaks to itself, simply because it is a very tightly knit community, but on the other hand, really also, in order to just sort of be open to the world, needs to be quite cosmopolitan. So Iceland, in spite of its remoteness, 
it's kind of a, a switchboard, basically, an intersection uh, of, of also global tendencies. And it's, it's always challenging, sort of what comes out there. Yeah, it's really difficult, I think, just to start a discussion of an artist by speaking about where that artist comes from. Because, of course, in, in a global economy, in a global world, sometimes these things don't really seem to matter. Or you don't want to have too much sense of, um, of uh, causality, I guess. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but I think in this instance it really does make sense. Let me read you a quote from Ragnar about Iceland. He says, in Iceland there's this idea that we don't really belong in the world. This country in the middle of the ocean and so far from other countries. I wish I could do it in his accent. What I love about Iceland is that the only people we admire are poets. There are no great conquerors or heroes, no great industrial tycoons or politicians, and no respect for business people or material wealth. They did have a little corruption problem right. a few years ago. <laughs> Cost it on the president, yeah. <laughs> I think making art comes from being a little allergic to society, not wanting to belong. I think this, this is an installation. We're going to show you a little clip, or a little uh, uh, Brady Bunch uh, uh, alignment, as we did before, of the installation that's currently up in New York in, at the Loring Augustine Gallery in Bushwick. And this really might give you some sense of his, of how his, he, he finds creative nourishment in his homeland of Iceland. It's called World Light, The Life and Death of an Artist. And he's always sort of playing with ideas of romanticism, but kind of stepping outside of the rom romantic at the same time as he's immersed in it. So you can see that there's this kind of love-hate idea about romanticism in his work. This is after the Nobel Prize winner, the Icelandic author Haudur Lexness's four-volume book about the tragic life of a poet. It was written in 1937 uh, to 1940. So let's see just a second of this. Here begins a film of world life. Halpers Laxness America Epic World life has everything. Poverty, loneliness. Um, can we go back to two slides back? Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry. It, it, hopefully that is tantalizing enough. It's a it's a six channel video uh, installation, very large and very compelling. And in it, he plays the part, of course, of the moderator, the commentator, dressed in the dinner jacket, introducing the film. And as he's introducing the film, they're making the film, and so they show. And people can walk in and out from the street, so they're showing the film as it's made from the inside out. And so there are little bits and pieces in which uh, actors are portraying this starving poet, this sad orphan poet, as he falls in love and falls out of love and suffers loss and tragedy. Um, but at the same time, it's you know somebody yelling "cut" and you know bring me bring me some water. And so you get a sense of the inside and outside together. Um, Ragnar's really a child of the theater, and that comes across mm -hmm. in this. His father and mother were both actors in Reykjavik, um, and he remembers watching actors rehearse over and over again. Um, another, another thing he has said is uh, about rehearsals, and rehearsals I think is important when you think about what's upstairs, all the longing to make something great, but it's never great. It's always mediocre. And I just love that. I love it when people, when human beings are trying to achieve something and it sort of doesn't happen. I think it's the ultimate human moment. So he's kind of deconstructing this whole romantic narrative in the same time that he's paying homage to it. So I think it's, it's really, he's been called a clown, kind of like the clown of the art world, and there's always this sense of him trying to puncture things, and there's, there's an element of humor. Um, but there's also an, a, a genuine element of pathos, I think, in a lot of his work. And so returning to some of the themes um, kind of of that interconnected um, landscape in, in Iceland, um, we have a, f a few uh, slides that Mark had, had put together of just some other artists and their connections. Yeah, uh, uh, let's mention that the, the connection between uh, different artists, uh, uh, his godmother was Bjork's music teacher. Um, you know, everybody knows Bj Bjork, in fact, was a, was a huge inspiration for Ragnar, uh, as, as she has been for many Icelandic artists over the year, years. And I think part of it is that she has, uh, she has shown that you can be a, a very uh, strange 
you know, you can be very primal, kind of evoking the, this, this sense of Icelandic history, and you can still live in Iceland, and you can have an international audience. So I think even that is, is a very significant inspiration for, for a lot of artists. On the lower left is a work by Gabriela Friedrich's daughter, um, another Icelandic artist whose, whose videos and performances are painfully slow. I mean, they just they enact over hours and hours, and they're meant to evoke primal myths and medieval legends. Uh, Ragnar has said that people in Iceland still believe in elves. I don't know if that's true, but they do, okay. <laughs> and then the next slide is uh, uh, Gabriella's album cover for Bjork. So you get a sense of, the, of their being connected together. Maybe I comment uh, on this one here. One influence, uh, or perhaps one of the, the one of the greatest uh, living Icelandic, or in this case Icelandic Danish artist, uh, artist is Olafur Eliasson, uh, who's over the last two decades or so uh, done all kinds of uh, work where sort of nature is always uh, at the center. Um, but often, what he explores as nature is is very much man-made. Here's a, a shot from his weather system in Tate Modern, I think, 2000 me out five, nine-ish, somewhere in the middle there, and where he basically created a weather system, an entirely self-contained uh, environment, basically, to be enjoyed by the visitors. And just as uh, Eliasson very much experiments with how nature, however man-made it might be, interacts with our senses, how it sort of imprints itself on our perception, um, uh, Ragnar is also very much uh, um, invested into exploring our, our senses, our sort of emotionality, our affects. And just as much as this has a certain kind of artifice to it that, um, well, makes us wonder about what is real and what isn't, uh, Ragnar too, and I think another word I would use for what you described earlier is also, there's always something ironic in his relationship to the world as much as to landscape and uh, to nature, his relationship to Iceland, as we saw it earlier, yeah, it kind of is serious, but it kind of isn't, and I think that opens up uh, wonderful ways for artistic uh, work, and so here's another of his influences, I think. And so, um, just as I think we've touched on in looking at these slides and talking about um, this type of art, whether it's video art or installation art, um, it's really not happening in a vacuum. These artists are aware of one another and of, of the artists that preceded them. So um, I, I think it would be great if, Mark, if you could share, um, and Lutz too, of course, um, some of the artists who came before Ragnar that have um, kind of real bearing on his development. Yeah, he went to art school in the late 90s and early aughts, and uh, there he learned about performance artists like Vito Acconci uh, on, the, on the left, and Chris Burden on the right, Carol E. Schneeman, a lot of artists working in New York in the 60s and 70s, and these artists were very interested in creating this sense of uh, uh, narrowing the gap, I think, between art and life, and so their performances were oftentimes body-related, their own bodies, there was oftentimes an element of masochism to them, and so the body became a symbol for, for the, the uh, struggles that every individual faces in, in uh, trying to, to live, live her life, or live his life in society. Um, but, but the quality of the films and the videos, there was a very self-conscious in these early works, a very self-conscious sense of amateurism, so the, you know, the appeal of, of sort of the grainy uh, street handheld, street gorilla uh, uh, handheld camera work, this sense that that gave it a, a, a feeling of urgency, of authenticity, of, of actually being real rather than being filmic, rather than being sort of commercially uh, uh, shaped and formed. Another element I think that is so key um, to Ragnar's um, work and, and, and anyone who has been up to see the piece I'm, I'm sure has noticed this, this theme of, of uh, duration, that it's longer than what we might expect given its subject matter. Um, and so I know that there are some really great influences in terms of these, these pieces and this theme that kind of tests our patience as an audience. Mm -hmm. Um, one term that we had used in our preparations for this uh, roundtable was endurance art, and um, Ragnar certainly fits into that uh, kind of theme, both on the side of the maker of the art, 
but also as far as the uh, recipient is concerned. What you see here is a very, very minuscule clip from Andy Warhol's uh, Empire, a film that lasts, if I recall correctly, eight hours and a little bit. And um, what you see is basically what you get. Um, those eight hours um, um, will show you exactly the Empire State Building, uh, uncut, basically. Um, and um, Ragnar very much lives in that tradition that we have seen uh, to some degree since the early 1960s, starting with Warhol, of making art uh, that perhaps exceeds sort of what both an artist can take, but also what audiences can take in. Uh, providing us with artworks that you cannot see in a single sitting uh, that um, sort of really exceed anything that uh, we know from the reception of other artworks and that thereby really challenges uh, our ways of what we, how we want to encounter artistic pieces uh, in the first place. These are pieces that have enormous durations, that work really hard with repetition, uh, that maybe push us to the brink or even across the brink of boredom. Uh, and one is very quick to dismiss this kind of work as precisely that, oh, it's boring. Um, but uh, in many respects, this might be the point of endurance art uh, to make us explore boredom, repetition, um, pieces that might last for six hours and might only viewed by us for two or three or maybe only for two or three minutes. Uh, as something where boredom can become productive, where we all of a sudden see things on screen that we haven't seen before, or listen in music to something that we would simply miss if we just rushed through it, or that would less allow us to kind of return to it at another moment and have a completely new relationship to the piece simply because we return to it at a different moment in our own life and all of a sudden realize that whatever is repeated is never repeated identically. Uh, but each repetition produces a slight grain of newness uh, each time. And Ragnar's really that kind of artist who um, maybe taxes our attention, overtaxes our attention way too much. At the Hirshhorn, I think there's a piece up right now where a model in gold dress plays the chord E on an electric guitar for three months. Um, uh, there's, a, there's, there's sort of some changeover in terms of the person, but I think each person has to do it for a whole day before the next one comes in. Um, and uh, maybe we can talk a bit about what that is all about. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. We'll show some uh, very brief slips, uh, uh, clips. We won't test your endurance uh, too much. Um, but, uh, but I think the idea, as, as Lutz said, it's not necessarily the, with the expectation. Like Andy Warhol didn't think somebody was going to sit for eight hours through the empire, but you, you give it the amount of time that you want to give it. It's, it's no different from sitting in front of a painting, only the painting doesn't change. You give it two seconds or 20 seconds or three minutes or eight minutes, and, and so it's a conscious choice that you have, and you can always come back, and as with a painting, for me anyway, if it's a great painting, I come back five times, I see it five different ways and five different uh, kind of lights, and I think that that's really part of the idea. One of his principal influences has been uh, Marina Abramovich, and so let's, uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is an incredible uh, piece. It was at the Museum of Modern Art, uh, her retrospective called The Artist is Present, and she was very present. Um, certainly in this, in this performance piece, it was a 700-hour-long 700, 700 performance piece. He sat in a chair for seven hours a day, six days a week, and people could come and sit across from her. As long as they and as long as they wanted. And all they did was stare at each other. And uh, so it sounds very, very simple, and it sounds uh, like a very oddly contrived situation. And she didn't really expect many people to do it. And she was kind of gearing up for, for uh, you know, long periods between people. But over 1,400 people actually did sit in front of her. And they were very, they reportedly were very moved by the experience and, and felt this human connection. And again, that, that slowness and the, I, I, I think, the tendency in contemporary society to actually not look at each other, to not pay, pay attention to each other, to rely so much on language that we don't actually see. And I think these are all part of what, uh, what Marina's work is really about. I think yeah, the uh, Abramovich is a, is a great example of how Ragnar um, emulates certain kind of models, repeats them if you wish, but also carries them somewhere else. And, well, we 
heard from Abramovich that she actually practiced for months, actually physically, in order to be in a position to um, do this kind of installation. She sat still for eight hours a day, uh, and that actually took all kinds of physical training, basically, to get there doing this, not just, well, for three months, but every day, basically. Um, and so there was a sort of an atmosphere of extreme sort of physical self-challenge and also seriousness basically attached to this. This is a very serious, profound experience to sit vis-a-vis -vis her and look into her eyes for however long you decide. Ragnar's work sort of has that kind of spirit too, you know, carried over for a, a really, really long time. But his seriousness, well, when he repeats it, also becomes ironic and playful. Um, if you see the visitors, um, um, ever have seen it or will see it after this, uh, this event. Um, it's also a, a piece uh, that sort of challenges our sense of time, that asks for prolonged durations, that asks some very profound questions. But the, you see also that the actor, the, the musicians, the performers, well, aside from all the seriousness, there's a lot of fun that's going on there uh, in recording this and preparing for this. Um, there's a lot of, well, stuff that has been drunk and smoked before they entered the, the place. And uh, sort of in terms of their preparation, they seriously didn't go through that rigorous training that Marina had to go through. Uh, so he repeats, but he repeats with a difference. And I think that that's a really great point um, to talk about kind of the playfulness of Ragnar Kjartansson and kind of some of its, its real appeal uh, to, to audiences. And so I think if we could explore um, just how music um, and particularly how popular music has shaped um, his aesthetic and what, what he does. Yeah, very playful. Um, he's a fan of especially American music and especially American country music. I think that was one of the reasons why he wanted so much to come to Nashville. He, he had the, uh, the mistaken uh, idea that we were all about country music here. I don't know where he got that. But <laughs> he remembers as a kid playing uh, country radio around his, his you know, artsy parents' home in, in Iceland, just driving them completely up the wall. They did, they did not understand how he could be listening to Hank Williams and Johnny Cash and Dolly Parton and all those people that are kind of the classics of country music. But he just thought that the simplicity was the thing, this, the, the, the emotional power, the simplicity. And so this has been a great inspiration for him. And one of the, the pleasures, I guess, of experiencing the visitors is as serious a work of art as it is, as Lutt said, there, there are bits of humor, but it is also incredibly seductive. I mean, one, you know, there's nothing like music, I think, to sort of bring your heart into play. And that's something that he has uh, done very well. So let's see a couple of examples. Let's start with Satan is Real. actually from a Leuven Brothers song, kind of a, 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 a purposeful mistranslation of a Leuven Brothers song. Uh, the Leuven Brothers sang, Satan is real and he's working in spirit. He can tempt you and lead you astray. So he's, he's mistranslated or misheard it or just is being very playful about it. So there's a strong influence of religion. Oddly enough, he's not a particularly religious person, 
but he went to church with his Lutheran mother while his atheist father stayed home. He, he talked his way into being a Catholic altar boy, even though he wasn't Catholic. Um, so, <laughs> so, so religion is really important to him. This is, this is an early work called God. We might not test our patients too much today. Yeah, I just think it's such a such a northern Protestant thing to say. But then you see him kind of looking like Bobby Darren or something, or uh, just the irony and the paradox, and the, again that seductiveness, the the, uh, the disconnect between what you're seeing and what you're hearing. I think is is quite extraordinary. Um, he's worked with. Uh, he's kind of an impresario. He doesn't always do the performances himself. He has worked with the band The National. We'll see a little clip of a, uh, of a piece called A Lot of Sorrow. This is a six hour long performance that was held at PS1 at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and basically there's a song by The National called Sorrow. It's about two minutes and 30 some seconds that he really loves. So he asked them to play the song over and over again for six hours. So the playlist is very short. Um, in a way, and, <laughs> and it's exactly what, what Lutz was saying, is the idea of that repetition and how you can kind of see, see minute changes. When you look at the Warhol film Empire and you see some lights come on, all of a sudden that's kind of exciting, you know, it, because you're, you've been lulled into this sense of sameness and then a, a subtle thing, you start to notice subtleties and that I think is what happens as you sit through the, um, through the as much as you can uh, through the uh, Nationals presentation. We're only going to do one encore tonight. This is the last one. <laughs> This, uh, this is called Sorrow. <laughs> Sorrow found me when I was young. Sorrow, it is sorrow one. Sorrow, they put me off the pit. It's in my honey, it's in my milk. Don't leave me hurt, my heart belongs. go ahead and move us along just so that we can can cover a little bit more ground today um, but I'm always really struck by that piece with the national and its real relationship to documentaries of concert footage um, or music videos so there's this very kind of strange distinction that we're asking visitors and audience members to make I think between uh, what Ragnar is doing and what um, uh, 
popular music um, and pop stars are asking of their audience. And so I, this it was a little bit too much of an amusing juxtaposition. So we have Ragnar and his bathtub, and we have Beyonce um, from a music video, um, also in a bathtub. Um, and, and I think that, you know, absolutely what Beyonce and artists like that are doing uh, is profound and, and does affect people and has great merit. And so I think it's worth exploring um, what makes Ragnar's work fall into this category of fine art um, or be museum worthy um, when there are so many musicians and directors that are, that are also making striking work. Thanks for pulling up that slide. It's quite, quite amazing. I mean, to continue the uh, uh, just one, one thought about, uh, that came from an earlier moment. I mean, um, uh, boredom has a bad press in our society. I mean, we're always on. Uh, we're constantly asked to multitask. We sort of spend more time on screen than we ever wanted because there's so much stuff hap happening on screen. And sort of boredom has become really a thing that we all try as, as, as violently as possible to, to avoid and uh, to give boredom actually good press is a, is a, a courageous thing and, and what Ragnar is really trying to do is to, to make us explore boredom sort of extreme durations as a space where we can kind of clear our perceptual filters, you know, where we can just um, blank out to some degree uh, in order to actually be able to see something, when something new happens, to see and recognize this newness as new. Uh, we often have lost that kind of ability. Something new happens, we don't even notice it because we're so busy multitasking at all fronts. And uh, I think this is also, and this is sort of my bridge to, to your question, what he's trying to pursue with his, uh, his installations. Um, is this work, that one might ask, is this something that we could also just watch on our cell phone screens or in a local movie theater uh, or sort of just on the go anywhere else like we watch so many other music pieces? And, and I would say radically no. Uh, there's something very particular in his work that requires the museum. And not just in the sense of that we probably wouldn't look at this anywhere else. That would be sort of like a, a minimalist argument, right? Um, but um, here's something that in a very profound way takes the space of the entire installation into account. Uh, when we had the Brady Bunch version earlier um, with the nine screens all parallel, it's a completely different experience than actually being in the exhibition upstairs to um, um, find a place or shift your place within the exhibition to look at different screens, to review the whole piece from a different kind of perspective, to move around, and by moving around at the brink, perhaps, of boredom, uh, by moving around in this exhibition to constantly actually resample the piece, and I use this word very deliberately, we kind of become our own author of this piece. We can for a while align ourselves with the drummer, for a while we might want to go to the cellist or then we stay at the bathtub. Uh, wherever you locate yourself in this space of the exhibition, you'll actually hear the music differently and you also see things differently. So in the end it's up to us actually as viewers uh, to inhabit the space, make it our own, change it as we go along and make that sense of duration and possible boredom uh, productive. And, and all of this can, can really only happen in an installation space. Uh, when we have this on a flat screen, we would never have that, that kind of um, experience. And I've seen the piece here a, a good number of time, times, and uh, each time I go, well, I, I spend time with the musicians and sort of trying to find new ways of seeing the piece, but I almost spend as much time um, looking at other people looking and listen, well, you can't listen to other people listening, but looking at other people listening um, and uh, sort of observing how we all actually engage with this piece and how each of us, every one of us, sort of tries to find a new foothold in the piece or find a new way of relating to it. And as I do that, uh, we will also all start to explore our own viewing of this piece, our own listening to this piece. And for that, it just takes the whole space here in the museum, something that a music video could never do as such. And um, uh, for that reason, um, I mean, any rendition of this piece that you might see on YouTube or here on this screen, don't go for it. Um, but it go but upstairs. It's, not, it's not quite just about space, I think, because the national, that took place in real time, in real space, mm -hmm. but the way we can experience it is through a flat 
film, so we're not as physically in, involved right. as we are with the visitors, but I think there's something else. I mean, the point that you make about boredom, and maybe it's a word that if we shunted that to the side and said instead the word reverie or something, mm -hmm. you know, because when you're bored, when you're sitting there, what you're doing is you're thinking about yourself. When you're not thinking about yourself, you're actually not bored. Right. And you think, I'm bored. And then time goes by and you think, what time is it? And how is my body, you know, sort of interacting with time? But after a while, I mean, I think if enough things change, enough, and the difference between Beyonce's video and, and Ragnar's video is, Ragnar's is in real time and you can watch the whole thing, whether it's, whether it's uh, the visitors or, or a lot of sorrow, things change. You can watch Beyonce a thousand times and it won't change one little bit. And so there's that, and you might, and that still is good because you might still see new things, but that idea of being willing to sort of still the voice, mm -hmm. your voice, mm -hmm. and allow that experience to wash over you is really critical. We have a, a short video that kind of shows you the installation. Again, not, not a perfect analog. can't emphasize enough how much I encourage you if you have time today to go up and see the exhibition because truly the video gives us a sense of what the space is but the sound is, is not doing it justice nor is nor is the picture quality um, so it really is a space that you can inhabit and, and with other people which I think is yeah. is a really um, important part of how we experience it um, so I've, I have a final question for you both and this question may spawn multiple kind of sub questions but um, this piece has been called a generational masterpiece. It's been really lauded um, by a lot of people in the art world as this, as this great, great piece. And, and we've seen a really wonderful response to it here at the center as well. Um, so just as a, a general kind of question to you both, what makes it, the visitors, so memorable and, and invokes such a strong response from people? There will be way many hours one could answer this question so maybe one too, one way of tackling it is that um well uh, we we live in times that have often been called in particular over the last four or five weeks as very divisive times um and uh, times where people don't come together and live in various kinds of bubbles we also live in times um, where um, it's very quick to fall the kind of media that we live with as uh, tools that separate us from the world, that sort of enclose us and basically um, make us unable to communicate with each other in really profound, um, reverent ways in many respects. What I find so moving about this piece is that we have um, sort of a staging of eight um, plus a group actually, eight musicians uh, that are all separated from each other, uh, that are all sort of within, if you wish, their own kind of media environment. They all have earphones on, they're only connected by microphones and what they hear through their, their earphones. And what we nevertheless see them doing is to try to establish to get into sync with each other. They're constantly struggling for harmony, if you wish. They really have to work hard in order to get that. They lose their sense of synchronicity and then they regain it again but they do some real work uh, in spite of all the fun that they're having in order to establish a sense of community, if you wish. Not uh, in spite, but with the help of the kind of media technologies that they actually bring into play. They need the microphones, they need the earphones to actually connect to each other. So what we see here is, uh, on, on some sense, uh, if you want this as a kind of symbol or an allegory of society, we see sort of very individualized uh, kind of little nodes, you see sort of people that seem to be isolated from each other and nevertheless with the help of music, with the help of also technology, with the help of song and with the help of passion in many respects, they manage to connect to each other and celebrate a sense of coming together of community um, that is, is quite unique. And uh, I must say sort of witnessing this and I want to almost call it sort of struggle for community over 60 minutes and the celebration thereof at the end 
it's profoundly moving, particularly in our sort of times where um, we often feel like we're really locked into forms of isolation that are quite unique to our moment. So for me, this is a